I want to begin this morning's message in the same place we started last week, which is uh, the 14th chapter of the book of Luke. And we looked at uh, verses uh, 25 through, I believe, through 33, and we're going to start this morning and do that again. So beginning in verse 25, uh, the good doctor writes, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money and everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Like millions of other people in this world, Didi and I have an Amazon Prime membership. Why would we want that? If you go to the Amazon website, you'll find that an Amazon Prime membership offers you many benefits, and pretty much all of them are prefaced with the word free. Free two-day shipping on, on items you purchase, free same-day delivery on selected items in uh, eligible zip codes, Free, unlimited access to streaming of thousands of hit movies and TV shows. Free access to over a million songs on the Amazon Music platform. And free books, magazines, newspapers you can read on a wide array of supported electronic devices. In short, an Amazon Prime membership offers a host of free perks off the low, low price of $14.99 a month. And with that one caveat, if one desires these kinds of services, an Amazon Prime membership provides excellent value at no additional cost. Speaking of that word caveat, what is a caveat? The Cambridge Dictionary defines the word caveat as a warning to consider something before taking any more action or a statement that limits a more general statement. With that definition in mind, the word free is often subject to one's interpretation of the value of what is received for the price paid. At the heart of our faith lies salvation by grace through faith. Salvation by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This statement has three parts, salvation, grace, and faith. And all these are equally important, all the parts, they constitute three inseparable components of God's plan for the redemption of man. The first component, salvation, can be defined as the act of being delivered, redeemed, or rescued. The Bible tells us that since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden, each person is born with a sinful nature inherited from Adam. Romans 5.12 says that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because of all sin. So here we learn that sin is what causes us to die. However, far beyond the cold reality of certain physical death, sin destines each dead person to eternal separation from God in hell. Consequently, in one way or the other, every human seeks or needs deliverance from that sort of fate. How are we delivered from sin and death? Throughout history, most religions have taught that salvation is achieved by good works. Others teach that, that uh, acts of contrition, saying we're sorry, along with living a moral life, are the way to atone for our sins. However, while sorrow over sin is, is necessary, that's part of it, the Bible teaches us that regret alone will not save us from sin. 
we may repent of our sins, which is also valuable, and set our sights on never sinning again. But as the saying goes, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We can fill our lives with good works, but in God's perfect justice, even one sin makes us a sinner. Therefore, no matter how well-intentioned or good we may be, we do not have the power, means, or goodness to overcome the sinful nature we inherited from Adam. Considering that insurmountable human flaw, we need something much more powerful in our lives, and this is where grace comes in. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Amen. Amen. By being justified through God's grace, through the completed work of Christ on the cross, we are forever vindicated and determined to be sinless in the eyes of God. With a spiritual acquittal like that, our sin no longer separates us from God, nor does it sentence us to hell. Again, this grace isn't earned by any effort on our part, otherwise it could not be called grace. If our good works earn salvation, then God would owe us our due. But no one can earn heaven. Therefore, God is not obligated to man. That said, salvation flows from God's goodness and love alone. That brings us to the third component of God's plan of redemption. The means by which God has chosen to bestow his grace upon us is faith. What is faith? As Hebrews 11, 1 explains, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Salvation is, is obtained by, by sight unseen faith in God's son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done, specifically his death on the cross and his resurrection. But as it is with grace, faith is, is not something that we generate ourselves. Again, Ephesians 2, 8 says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now this verse actually points to the gift being one of grace, but both grace and faith are gifts from God. Bottom line, God bestows saving grace through saving faith to redeem us from sin and deliver us from its consequences. Psalms 8 says, salvation belongs to the Lord. So in my mind, those five words... Five short words alone point to God as the sole source and owner of all three components of salvation. The Lord Jesus died for our sins and he rose for our justification. He freely and fully forgives those who accept his gift of grace and this acceptance comes through faith. Now while God's word in its entirety, the Bible readers know this, it's nuanced, it's multifaceted, it's complex, but this is the essence of salvation by grace through faith. So considering all the things I've said so far this morning, we can personalize scripture and rightly say, for it is by grace I have been saved through faith. And this is not from myself. It is the gift of God. We can make that personal. However, as it was with Amazon Prime, there's a caveat. There's a cost involved in receiving God's free gift of grace. Pastor Chris, that sounds like a contradiction. How could something be free and costly at the same time? So I thought about that this week, and to help sort this out, I want to go back in time and think of a 1960s TV series called The Beverly Hillbillies. I know some of y'all, well, I think most of y'all are, but some online may not be as old as I am, uh, but I'm assuming that everybody's all familiar with the Beverly Hillbillies. So suppose that instead of Pastor Chris, my real name is Jethro Bodine, and I tell my Uncle Jed that my lifelong ambition is to become a brain surgeon. Woo, doggy, Jethro. Becoming a brain surgeon sure will cost a lot of money. Nonetheless, Uncle Jed offers to pay for my education. He agrees that for the next 10 years, he's going to pay my tuition, cover the cost of all the books I need, the meal ticket, and a place to stay while I get educated. In terms of upfront costs, while pursuing my future hopes and dreams is expensive, it's completely free to me. That is, except for one caveat. 
Once I accept Uncle Jed's offer, I commit myself to years of demanding study, sacrifice, and arduous effort. My friends and family will all go places that I can't do, and they'll do things that I can't do because I've committed to something with benefits that are not yet realized. So despite the gracious gift Uncle Jed has offered me, it's only prudent for me to do some cost accounting before I decide to follow my dream of becoming a brain surgeon. If, that don't, if you don't get it through that, I'm going to give you another similar illustration. Suppose Pastor Dan offers to rent an airplane and take me up for a free ride. Ha! <laughs> I love Pastor Dan, but I've never forgotten what happened to me the one time that I went for a ride in the back of his pickup truck. And, and I sure ain't getting in an airplane with him. Now, if you haven't heard that story, let me just say that if he offers you a ride in the back of his pickup truck, don't do it. Don't do it. If I accept Dan's offer of a free airplane ride, I've placed my life in his hands. If he lands safely, I'm safe. But if he crashes, I die. So my decision is certainly worth some careful consideration. In the scripture that, that we read this morning and that we used in last week's message, Jesus outlines the terms and cost of following him. And while we're not going to rehash every part of last week's message for the benefit of those who may have missed it, I want to take a minute and give you the skinny version. As Jesus traveled about announcing the coming kingdom of God, many Jewish people enthusiastically listened to what he had to say. Nonetheless, Jesus knew that more than a desire to knew who he was, most desired the benefits of what he was doing. The people were impressed by his miracles, many looking to benefit from a miracle of their own. However, most remained skeptical concerning his claims that he was God's long-awaited promised Messiah. The popular thought of the day regarding God's promised Messiah anticipated a powerful individual who would immediately expel Rome and usher in a restored Jewish kingdom. Others simply hoped that whoever he was, he would keep healing the sick and providing all-you-can-eat fish dinners. But when Jesus told a crowd that to be his followers, they must carry a cross, it was a deal-breaker for most who had come out to hear his words. We must remember that at the time, Jesus had not died on a cross, nor had anyone given any credible witness or spread rumors of a supernatural raising of a human being from the dead. Hence, as Jesus appeared and spoke to those people, he did so in the same human form, using the same human voice that all the people spoke with themselves. Furthermore, as those today who love that symbolic meaning of the cross, we must understand that when Jesus told this crowd of curious followers that they must pick up a cross, it would have been horrifying to them. Again, to a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only, and that was death by crucifixion. A humiliation and suffering that, that would end up making somebody beg for death. In short, people of the day despised even the mere thought of a cross. So when Jesus associated following him with taking up a cross, many who thought they wanted to follow him quickly lost their enthusiasm. If you missed last week's message, I encourage you to take advantage of our recorded live streams on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. With next Sunday being uh, our Thanksgiving service, Marking the beginning of the Christmas season, I sat down this past Monday morning to begin the, the process I go through every week of coming up uh, this time with one more standalone message that we could squeeze in there before we head into the holiday season. And after considering some of the positive feedback I heard after last week's message, I pulled up my notes and I looked to see if there's any possibility of continuing in the same vein of study this week. As I did so, it occurred to me that, that while last week's message seemed to answer some un, unasked questions, there's an important question concerning the cost of following Jesus that we didn't cover. And that question is, what is the cost of not following Jesus? Have you ever looked at your decision to follow Jesus in those terms? Jesus, he clearly wants us to understand what a commitment to follow him entails. 
Faithfully following his teachings has required many parents, children, and spouses to disavow each other. True disciples need to be so on fire for him that if need be, they're willing to separate from friends and family members who reject his way and even be ready to face a humiliating and excruciating death. Therefore, life in Christ is not something we should agree to without careful consideration. I was surfing the web one day this week and I came across a list by a, a Ivy League University titled Six Steps to Effective Decision Making. And the six steps outlined in that document entail gathering information, weighing the evidence, calculating the cost, evaluating alternatives, making a choice, and then taking action. So right off the bat, the Bible provides us with more than enough information to complete steps one through three. And the information and evidence revealed confirms that the decision to follow Jesus will likely come at a high price in terms of personal sacrifice. So that brings us again uh, to some more questions today, or the questions that, that I mentioned. What are the alternatives to following Jesus, and what does it cost us if we decide against it? In Matthew 7, 13 through 14, Jesus uses a, a metaphor to address these same questions. Uh, beginning in verse 13, Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Here, Jesus assesses the cost of following him in terms of life and death. Following Jesus takes us on a narrow and challenging path, in other words, costly, but it is the way that leads to life. In contrast, while refusing to follow Jesus means, it may mean that life's road is a bit wider and easier, that path eventually leads to destruction. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So, Jesus says, if you choose the wide and easy way, you also choose to give up an abundant life. And that's not all one would lose. So we're going to put on our spiritual accounting hats for a few moments and look at some gains and losses associated with the optional choices we can make relating to a personal decision to follow Jesus. In Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 4 through 9, Paul writes, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all your eloquent words and all your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly await for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. This scripture tells us that following Jesus leads to enrichment in every aspect of life. It means that, that he will confirm us as blameless before God. It means you're fully gifted to accomplish your new purpose. And it means you have unrestricted fellowship with God through his fellowship with Jesus and the indwelling Holy Spirit. If you choose to follow Jesus, you can put all that in the plus column. Otherwise, you're already in the red. John, John 17, 3 says, And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Choosing another path means that you give up eternal life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. So choosing your own path means you opt out of the new life that comes with following Jesus. Uh, Romans 8, 1 basically says the same thing, or it, it, it says something that's related to that. It says there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. 
Choosing another path means you remain condemned to a life that ends in eternal death. Romans 5, 1 says, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Choosing an alternate path means that there's no peace with God. Finally, in 2 Peter 1, 4, Peter writes the following. He says, his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So choosing your own path means that you pass on God's great and precious promises with no hope of ever escaping a world marked by sin and death. This is just a few of the potential costs or benefits that can be placed in your spiritual ledger in the plus or minus column, depending on the decision and effort you make concerning the call to follow Jesus. And with that, I think you'll agree that the Bible more than adequately establishes the decision to do otherwise is one that quickly leads to long-term spiritual bankruptcy. Most of y'all know me pretty well, and those that know me real well know that I like my space. You also know that I like schedules and routines and well-thought-out plans with predictable outcomes. And with that in mind, I, I suppose you could say that I like to live every moment with maximum meaning and purpose. Consequently, some of the worst days of my life have been those days when I felt like I had lost my purpose. Many years passed before I realized that my personal preferences and, and the structured life that I prefer to live have nothing to do with my true God-given purpose. In the two verses following Jesus' words in, in the scripture we read this morning and used last week, he made it clear when you refuse to deny your desires, take up the cross, and follow him, you lose your effectiveness and purpose. In Luke 14, 34 through 35, that's the very next two verses, says salt is good for seasoning. But if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soul nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. When left outside in the elements, salt, uh, a valuable commodity in Jesus' day, is rendered worthless. Much like humans who choose to live outside God's eternal will and plan. All these illustrations and metaphors that, that Jesus uses in Scripture, in the Scripture we've been looking at over the past two weeks, provide us with uh, some fundamental and essential truth in what I think is a very relatable way. First and foremost, Jesus quickly ends the idea that simply saying yes offers us some kind of entitlement program. Although the gift of eternal life is free to anyone who asks, the asking requires a permanent transfer of ownership of one's desires and self-defined goals and purposes. And considering that transaction, counting the cost of following Jesus means recognizing and agreeing to live a new life on his terms. We can't follow Jesus in the world's way at the same time. That, that just don't work. And again, Following him may mean losing relationships and dreams and material things or even our lives. Those who, who follow Jesus for what they think they can get won't stick around when the going gets tough. With this kind of self-serving, shallow understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, the first time God's way conflicts with what we want or expect, the me-first faith that we've incorrectly brought into our beliefs will lead us to believe that God has betrayed us. When we have not carefully counted the cost of being a disciple, the threat of personal sacrifice will instinctively turn us away from him as we look for something else to, to gratify our selfish desires. There came a time in Jesus' earthly ministry when the free food stopped and the public opinion turned ugly. The cheering crowds became jeering crowds. However, Jesus knew ahead of time that that, that was going to happen. For some, if not most, the words that Jesus speaks in, in today's scripture or a searing deal breaker. 
You cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Other Bible versions translate that phrase given up as the English word renounce, which means to say formally or publicly that you no longer own, support, believe in, or have a connection with something. While renouncing might mean that we give up something material, more often it means that we emotionally let go of something so that whatever we possess no longer possesses us. That's Jesus' bottom line message, and he reminds us of that repeatedly. He reminds us that following him comes at a significant cost. However, in God's eternal perspective, far greater wealth is gained. Nonetheless, what you gain or lose is a result of your choices. And, and with that, today's message presents us with another choice. And that choice is, will you respond to the goodness of God and choose to follow Jesus all the way, or will you decide that his path is too narrow, constricting, and costly? And as you make these choices, remember that for every choice you make, your yes to one thing is a no to something else. As I wind down today's message, I want to look at one more passage of Scripture that's found uh, four chapters over in uh, the book of Luke, you know, chapter 18. And beginning in verse 18, uh, Luke writes, Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus asked him. Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery, you must not murder, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, honor your father and mother. The man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. When Jesus heard this answer, he said, there's still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. When Jesus saw this, he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, then who in the world could be saved? He replied, what is impossible for people is possible with God. Peter said, we left our homes to follow you. Yes, Jesus replied, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be repaid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. Who would, been, who would, who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost? to see if there's enough money to finish it. What king or military leader would go to war against another army without first sitting down with his counselors and figuring out if, if his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? A car salesman wants you to forget about the cost of a car and focus on the things that shine. But the underwriter at the finance company wants you to understand all the fine print and be sure that you can make the ongoing payments. The Gospel of Luke has a central message. God's mercy in the person of Jesus Christ has been offered to all without exception. However, God's gracious gift has one limitation, and that's our willingness to respond to his mercy. And while a, a, a fluffy superficial interpretation of God's mercy might invoke a feel-good response. True discipleship, the expected response to God's mercy, demands a high price in terms of self-denial, surrender to his will and purpose, and servanthood. This church and every other church is a frontline battlefield bunker in a war waged against the forces of evil. And Jesus needs builders and soldiers who are fully committed to building the kingdom of God and then defending it. What, what this building and the battle mean in practice for each of us will be something different. Perhaps uh, an unexpected uh, redeployment to a new job or a, a new town, or even uh, moving on to a new congregation of believers. 
nonetheless, if we answer the call to take up our cross and follow Jesus, we must remain at the disposal of God's plan. And Jesus tells us to choose carefully. He wants us to look at the alternatives. Not just look at them superficially, but look at them intensely. If you don't follow Jesus wholeheartedly, what will the highlight of your life be? A little bit of money, a nice house and car, uh, a few friends and some laughs, maybe a, a chef full of, of trophies and memorials to yourself. All these things have a place, but is this your life? Is, is this what you were made for? I submit to you that you were created for something much bigger than that. With that said, let me encourage you to take some time this week and use your Bible and create a balance sheet and compare the cost of following Jesus against the cost of staying behind. And, and I think you'll find that decision to be a no-brainer. And finally, as we leave here today, y'all remember to connect, equip, serve, and encourage one another, and we'll see y'all next time.